themselves through misogyny, through a reflection of themselves on the stage. No, for Malarmé, the Greek stage cannot constitute a new religion after Christianity. Why? Because the stage is precisely a representation, a fiction. And the moderns cannot go back to a religion of representation such as tragedy. For in the meantime, we have tested something else. We have tested the Latin Middle Ages. And what did they deploy? of which the Greeks knew nothing? Well, the Catholic Mass. Mallarmé is no longer a believer, certainly, but he always remains interested in the device of the Mass. Deleuze criticized severely him for this. How does a Mass function? Why is it not reducible to a scenic device? Why it is not reducible to a tragedy? Because the priest is not an actor. He does not replace the patient upon a stage with actors, but he assures the real presence of God through his coded gesture, ceremonial, the Eucharist, and sometimes very simple, with withdrawal, facing the audience. The Mass brings us something on the, on the order of the presence, not representation. God is there present, not represented, and not God is there, and not only his fiction. This passion descends into the very host, and it even brings about a physical assimilation, alimentation. We eat God. There is a real fact here. Malarmé was persuaded that if modern poetry was incapable of grasping for itself this capacity of the mass to really diffuse the divine, to pass from representation to presence, what he calls the treasure of the black dragon, Christianity will never be dethroned by art. It is this treasure that we must steal in order to put an end to the old religion. He theorizes this in several texts in divagation placed under, under the subtitle Office. In particular, in Catholicism, in 1895, texts where he broaches the question of the real and assured presence of the Eucharist. Now, 1895 is the year where he, when he stops work on the notes for the book. This is surely no chance occurrence. For the mass of the book, of the notes for book, proposes only readings and scenic representation, like Wagner. No Eucharisty, no real fact no real diffusion of a real passion. When Mallarmé understands that he has thus taken a wrong turn, that he has fallen into the same impasse as Wagner in representation, he abruptly changes direction and directs his energies towards the writing of the coup de day, whose premises appear the same year in one, in one of his critical texts, Le Livre Instrument Spirituel. But how will the coup de day resolve this vertiginous aporia? How will it realize a poem capable of bringing about a real presence of the divine and not a mere representation of the absolute? How, moreover, to envisage such a, division, uh, such a diffusion of the divine when poetry is deployed under the reign of nothingness and no longer under, under that of the old religious transcendence? You must understand that Mallarmé is very serious with that. He wants to resolve the problem of a religion of art replacing Christianity as one would resolve an equation. Let's come back now to the good day. We admit that there is an encrypted matter. It must be understood that nothing in the good day, nor indeed in any of Mallarmé's œuvres, allows us to deduce the existence of this matter. You can spend your whole life reading Mallarmé's writing and you will find no clue to put you on the right path. You can just find it by chance. There is nothing written in his whole oeuvre that allows us to rationally deduce that he had undertaken such a wager, precisely because he wanted it to be chance and not the, the erudition or the intelligence of a reader that discovered his procedure. Mallarmé thus threw the dice 
into the aleatory sea of historical reception, a cult whose discovery nothing could guarantee. We should remark here that the coup de day is inspired by a poem by Alfred de Vigny that is called La Bouteille à la Mer, Message in a Bottle. In this poem, a captain, before being drawn with his vessel, throws a bottle into which he places stellar calculations, that is to say calculations of constellations indicating a new navigable route that he has discovered. He does that in the hope that Providence will deliver them, will deliver this, this calculation to some unknown recipient. And Providence sells him well, for God guides his butter into the hands of a French fisherman who hands over the calculation to a scientist of our happy nation. nation. The difference, however, between the master and Vinny's captain is that in Malarmé, the throw of the bottle is not represented. It is really effectuated. The poem is performative because Mallarmé does exactly what he describes the master as doing. He asks himself, writing the poem, hesitating whether to throw his stellar number into the ocean of posterity. Will he play out his destiny as a poet by confiding confiding to his own divinity, chance, rather than providence, the care of revealing one day the metrical and stellar calculation by which he hopes to open a new passage for poetry. Once you have understood that Mallarmé doesn't write about the master, but that Mallarmé is really the master, throwing the dice of his number, that he is the real thrower of a number really hidden in the cloud, in the tempest of our misunderstanding in reading the poem, you have understood that you are faced with a true passion, that of the aging poet who states the ultimate meaning of his entire oeuvre, in his entire oeuvre upon a chance delivering to the judgment of eternal chance the responsibility for whether or not anyone ever discovers what is really happening in the poem. The coup de day is properly speaking a sacrifice, and this is for this reason that its ending word of the major is the word sacre, sacrifice, sac, consecration. Christ sacrifices his flesh, but Mallarmé sacrifices meaning, the meaning of his oeuvre. It is a sacrifice yet more spiritual than the Christic sacrifice. In a certain way, it removes the corporeal immediacy of the latter in order to express it in a higher form, Hegelian, in a Hegelian way, higher form. We can then understand Mallarmé's attachment to a matter whose essence lies not so much in giving, in giving its, right, its reason to verse as, let us recall, in assuring its cultic dimension. Let us remember that the metric for Malame is a guarantee for the verse to have a cultic dimension, the universal cultic dimension for communion. The encrypted matter allows the silent reader of the coup de day to evoke once again the presence of a real poet, not the representation of a fictitious, fictitious master, the presence of a real poem having assumed the really possible sacrifice, sacrifice of his earth, of the meaning of his earth, because only God can reveal this meaning. God, that means for Malame, only chance, stupid chance. It is a mental Eucharist for the reader that makes of the silent mental reading of the poem a solitary but universal ceremony perhaps the only type of ceremony that a modern can assume without rendering himself ridiculous. But the real point of the affair is not yet reached, for we still don't understand what is necessary about the, man, the number, what is divine about it, in short. The only divinity accessible to the poet of nothingness, as we know, is chance. Only chance is eternal. 
That is what literally the title of the Kudede, of the Kudede tells us. A throw of dice will never abolish chance. In other words, everything is subject to change. Every throw falls into the contingency of the aleatory, except the ch for chance itself, which no throw of the dice can ever engender or destroy. Thus, the eternal is change. Chance is our only infinite. Now, in, number for the, in order for the number to be not only the fact of a contingent throw, that of a simply human, and particular poet. In order for it to acquire a necessary dimension, it must fuse with chance, rather than simply being the result of chance. What does it mean? To understand this final enigma, we must return to Igitur, the unfinished tale of 1869. During this period, and under the influence of his friend Villiers de Lille-Adam, Mallarmé became, in, became interested in Hegel. He doubtless did not read Hegel himself, but probably a text by a certain Edmond, Schema, Edmond Scherer. Now in this article of Edmond Scherer, Mallarmé could have discovered Hegel's speculative conception of the infinite. Hegel considered that the divine infinite is infinite in the precise sense that it has nothing outside of it, which explains why the true God is for Hegel a Christian God, that is to say, a God who is incarnated in a singular man. For if God was only God, enjoying a transcendence like that of the Jewish or Quranic God, he would precisely not be everything, since he would not be human. The purely divine God does not have, does not have the finite in him, and consequently he is limited by the finite. Limited by the contingency he is not, finitude, imperfection, external to his nature. In order, for, in order for God to be authentically infinite, he has to pass into man, become man, become Jesus, thereby incorporating the finite into his own process. But God also must not remain in the state of humanity. In this case, he would be but finite, and he would lose his divine part. He must therefore return into the, his infinity, enriched by finitude. Jesus, Jesus must be crucified, must die, and reascend to the Father. As a commentator on Hegel says, in order for the infinite to pass, the finite must pass away. God must die as a man and rejoin himself in his proper infinity. Now it seems clear that Mallarmé in Egiture attributes to chance itself the property of the divine Hegelian infinite. In this style, it is chance that nothing escapes, that nothing is external to. No longer God, who is now cast down into nothingness.